Our guest today was elected to represent Illinois' 5th con Congressional District a little over nine years ago. He did his un undergraduate work at Roosevelt University. Our guest today earned his master's degree in public policy at the University of Chicago. He is a graduate of Loyola University School of Law. Give him a round of applause, there we go. He and his wife, Barbara, live in Chicago's Lakeview neighborhood. He is the proud father of two fabulous daughters, Allison and Megan. Ladies and gentlemen, Congressman Mike Quigley. Congressman. So why am I here again? Uh, I broke the mug and I said, dang, I gotta go speak to the city club again? <sighs> First of all, uh, thank you. It is an honor to be with you today, an honor to be back with the city club and to be with such distinguished guests. Um, it's an honor to serve, uh, an extraordinary time. Um, I wanna recognize a few folks. First, my staff, raise your hand from DC and Chicago. <clears throat> Uh, we forget, you know, come visit us. You know, our staff's here from D.C. They'd like to see you there. Uh, we give great tours, get people on the House floor. We give, uh, get people into the White House. You know, the demand has gone down. <laughs> we were trying to pinpoint exactly when. It's about 18 months ago. But uh, please, please visit. I tell people that in the last 18 months, again, irony alert, same time frame, when I talk to a group like this, I, I feel like I'm, I'm doing group therapy. <laughs> now, my sister who actually does group therapy reminded me, she goes, now you know, Mike, they're supposed to feel better after the session. <laughs> I make absolutely no guarantees. Uh, I do wanna recognize, uh, I could recognize everybody, it's a great group, but there's a few I need to. I have to thank the Lincoln Park Zoo who's here today. For purely selfish reasons, first they're an amazing institution, but they named a zebra after me. <clears throat> Go visit Mike the zebra. Someone said, does he respond to the name Mike? And the, the, the zoo folks told me he, he responds a lot better if there's food involved. <laughs> And my wife thought that was funny because she said it's the same with us. <laughs> I also want to thank places that uh, put me where I am, uh, my universities, our friends from Roosevelt, our friends, <clears throat> our friends from Loyola. <clears throat> I told the dean that uh, people said you get nervous debating in Congress. Somebody said, let me tell you, the training you get at Loyola. Uh, I was a criminal defense attorney 10 years, a, a first chair state's attorney or U.S. attorney, a far greater adversary, so thanks for the training, folks. And my friends from the University of Chicago, today I'm going to have them represented by my dear friend Barry Marum, Barry S. Marum. <laughs> my staff are again from D.C., I mentioned that, but I, I tell them, looks a lot of things to do, a lot of people to recognize. But if you want to have a perfect day in Chicago, I can tell you the great beginning, the great end. The great beginnings, breakfast at Ann Sather's. <laughs> and either lunch or dinner at Superdog. <laughs> Here's something among a long list of stuff that DC doesn't get. Somehow they don't have a clue about pizza or hot dogs. And, and I feel like, or cinema. When I first came there, they said, how did you get so well known so quickly among members? I was bringing cinnamon roll two packs from Ann Sather's. <laughs> I had members of Congress tell me I didn't get mine. And then they found out that their staff smelled them and stole them. <clears throat> uh, one more recognition. Um, I wasn't planning on this, but it, it's part and parcel to what we're talking about today. We lost a journalist journalist in Elizabeth Brackett. Um, she made me, as good journalists do, better at this job. Where I, I read a lot of 
writings by presidents who said, I hated the press, but they're really important, right? Greater accountability, my staff will tell you how much prep we do <clears throat> before we, we talk to a journalist. They make us think about our, the issues better. And uh, I'm never afraid of a great journalist. I'm afraid of the journalist being silenced. And that's part of the threat that concerns me. So Elizabeth, friends and family, our friends at WTTW, um, you did a great job. So how to begin? Uh, first, I'm doing what I have to do, not what I want to do. I want to talk to you about appropriations, right? I want to talk about bringing a, a billion dollars back to the CTA like we did the last month under President Obama, about the MWRD getting the money they need to build reservoirs. That's what this should be, right? Working on a bipartisan basis. Yet I'm chasing Russians. In a million years, working for Bernie Hansen, of all the things I imagined doing, sharing an office with John Cullerton and his extraordinary staffer sitting next to him, Kelly, I never imagined sitting next to Ambassador Kislyak in Finland talking about Russians in America. That I just, you know, wasn't gonna happen. But life takes us where we need to be. And this is where I need to be. Uh, they asked me if I get nervous about these things or doing the press. The answer is hell yes, right? It's not because, look, there's the obvious you're concerned you're embarrass yourself. You say something that you, stupid and it goes viral and sticks with you for the rest of your life. But there's a lot at stake here. When you see me on news stations, I'm not talking to the left, far left, far right of the base. I'm talking to the middle who hasn't figured this out yet, who is losing patience with this, right? From the day of the break-in till the president left office, Watergate took 28 months. And this is far more complicated and frankly, far more important. Put in perspective, the last time I saw President Obama at the White House, was December of 2016, month after the election. I said, we miss you already. <laughs> and ever positive, President Obama said, it'll be okay. And I said, no, it won't. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm hoping that we were both right. So what have we learned in the last year? The Russians attacked our democratic process. They hacked into email accounts, including those at the DNC, the DTRIP, and they had WikiLeaks release those. They, they weaponized social media and pitted Americans against Americans. They hacked into the boards of election, beginning with, thank you very much, state of Illinois, August of 16. They, they did it to attempt to attack our democratic functions infrastructure, and by the way, given what I'm gonna talk about later. Yes, they had cooperation, collusion, conspiracy. I'm gonna go back to law school and get my legal thesaurus, because collusion's the wrong word. But they had a candidacy openly engage with them and encourage them. Something Steve Bannon said was treasonous when he was referencing this meeting at Trump Tower, right? Perhaps he's speaking in a colloquial sense, but Think about this. Who reaches out to a foreign adversary to have them help them win a campaign in the United States? So I'm not going to minimize it. Mike Morrell, the deputy director of the CIA under President Bush and President Obama, he was there at 9-11. He was there when they got Osama bin Laden. He described what the Russians did as the political equivalent of 9-11. So here's today's takeaway. Trump policies and his reaction to what the Russians did is worse, will have a more profound impact on our country than what the Russians did. How did we get to that point? It's because through strong sanctions, acting like President Obama said to President Putin, cut it out, we can retaliate. We can discourage them. We can rebuild our election infrastructure. Sponsor on the Appropriations Committee, $380 million, decimal point in the wrong spot. Whenever I say decimal point in the wrong spot, talking about finances, 
I think of our mayor for some reason. Your decimal point's in the wrong spot. I thought about that when I used that line. Well, we're not spending nearly enough money, but we can. We can correct this through education, improved technology, greater transparency. We can inoculate ourselves against social media and cyber attacks. But the president's reaction can have a permanent impact, a negative impact, on the rule of law, the independence of the Justice Department, the law enforcement community, and the ability of the intelligence community to keep us safe and destroy international alliances built at the very beginning of the end of the Second World War. Now, I understand how this could be viewed in a very partisan context. I do have a few policy differences with the administration. But look, I respect the, pro the office and I respect the process. But more than at any time in our country's history, we are contending with the president who is at war with democratic norms. Breaking these norms presents an unprecedented danger, simply because they got us where we are. They ensured our peaceful and continued existence for almost 250 years. All this time, <clears throat> our founding documents, our principles, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, our separate but equal branches of government, they continue to stand. Why is this? Because in times of war, deep political division, national crisis, the system withstood assault. But the system is only as strong as those who lead it, those who defend it. We are reminded every day that government is a human enterprise. And it relies very heavily on very human participants. That doesn't just count members of Congress or people in the courts. No, it relies on citizens to vote, to not have 100 million people stay home at the next election, to protest, resist, engage, provide oversight, hold the system accountable. But more broadly, the president seems intent on eroding the things that make America, America. Our democratic institution, our respect for the rule of law, and ultimately our national security. See, now I gotta start all over. <laughs> Just like the guilt and that's all. The president's attacks on American institutions and his threats to what can be a very fragile democracy directly translate to his approach on national security and his assault on the liberal world order that emerged after the Second World War. This world order is under threat by its architect, the United States. It's held together through agreements, alliances, institutions, and norms but it's only as strong as America's promise to uphold it. And with a president that disregards our domestic rule of law, why we should be surprised for his disregard for diplomacy, international agreements. The president continues to scold. He's trying to tell me something. <clears throat> Thank you. I got about six underneath here now. Thank you. He continues to scold our NATO allies, even though they've been with us hand in hand through 9-11. I get it, Lithuania and some of the other Baltic states, even if they got to two or three percent of their domestic product, what's more important is the fact that they're our allies, right? That they share three years of being on the Intel Committee, that they share really important information that keeps us safe. If our NATO allies did nothing else but share information that keeps us safe, the deal would be worth it and aggravating them and insulting them and doing things that make them not trust us anymore will make everybody in this room less safe. He has abandoned the Paris Agreement, leaving the U.S. as the only U.N. member not signed. He has threatened our closest allies with tariffs that will lead to trade wars, which no one wins. The collapse of trust with our allies is exactly what our greatest adversaries want. The more cracks in this partnership, the greater the chance that another country that does not share our values will fill the void. You to understand. You know how they view America first as me first, selfish isolationism. When I was in Helsinki two weeks ago, the Russian ambassador said they see it as subjugation. I get it. 
They're going to say that. But it's along the political spectrum, it doesn't help at all our worldview. In their mind, we build walls. We ban Muslims. We attack our allies. And we separate families. Does anyone imagine that NATO believes that we'll be there for them when the chips are down? We have to get it. The world will spin without us. What are they saying in Europe? Our economy is as big as yours. We OK. What do they say in the Pacific Rim? We'll deal with China. They want us as an option, but we're turning our back on them. In FDR's last inaugural, he wrote, we have learned the simple truth, as Emerson said, that the only way to have a friend is to be one. We can gain no lasting peace if we approach it with suspicion and mistrust or with fear, end quote. We saw this play out in real time in the G7. As been pointed out, it was striking to watch the president rip our closest allies and embrace the world's most brutal dictator. Our allies are losing faith in us. And I'm a talk first guy. I'm for diplomacy. The world's a complicated place. I realize we have to talk to our adversaries. But we have to be smart and strategic about it. What we saw in Singapore was anything but strategic. Putin is getting an extraordinary return on his investment. And his goals are being delivered right before our eyes. Diminished the importance of the post-World War II world order. Create daylight between NATO and the G7 allies. Smear large international institutions like the EU and the UN. And these, of course, are actions that go against our interests. Weakening our faith in the system is a purposeful action undertaken by the president and his allies. Right out of the gate, where's the president? He's in front of the, the wall of honored fallen at the CIA. What did he talk about? How big the inauguration crowd was. But this was right after one of his initial tweets where he talked about how the intelligence community can't be trusted. Attacking the Department of Justice as a whole, attacking the Attorney General, and the Deputy Attorney General, firing and subsequently starting a war of words with the former FBI director, pushing out Director Andy McCabe. He regularly accuses DOJ, FBI, and CIA of corruption, lending credibility to the ongoing deep state narrative. Where was the deep state narrative when Comey spoke days before the election and opened up savage wombs with candidate Hillary Clinton? Must have been confused that day. And what recourse do we have as Americans? Well, I'll begin with the free press and the First Amendment. But the President and the White House are unrelenting in their attacks on this press. Just after meeting with Kim Jong-un, the President called the press the enemy of the people. It's the President of the United States speaking to the world. The, mayor, the President merely labels stories he disagrees with as fake news. He threatens press credentials. He calls out reporters by name, which he disagrees with, to embarrass them simply for doing their job. And if he agrees with them, his Fox and Friends, he's on their shows all the time. But his favorite punching bag, the Mueller investigation and the Justice Department. Russian hope, witch hunt, the reported claim that he has absolute authority over the Department of Justice. Now, as they have described it with our friend Rudy, who has somehow fallen off the wagon of, I don't know if they're going to revoke his law degree, but there's Rudy. It, but if what he said is true, you need to understand what it means, folks, that with the, the complete authority to control the Department of Justice, he can stop investigations of himself and his friends and start investigations of his enemies. It's protect himself politically and legally to undercut the credibility of the investigation by constant and relentless attacks, mostly rooted in conspiracy theories, and to weaken whatever findings Mueller comes up with. And folks, if you look at polling, it's working. Repeated attacks on the 13 angry Democrats. Now, it's not clear if I'm one of the 13, but I would be honored to be 13 or 14, whichever one it counts. <laughs> but let's remember what happened when they pointed Mueller, what people said back then. Jason Chaffetz, impeccable credentials. 
Adam Kinzinger, respected veteran FBI man, uh, independent, Senator Grassley, qualified, Senator Portman. 2017, Newt Gingrich tweeted that Mueller is, quote, a superb choice to be special counsel. His reputation is impeccable for honesty and integrity. The media should calm down now, end quote. The media should get really revved up about right now, folks. Contrast that with Newt's most recent statements where he says Mueller investigation is, quote, a breakdown of constitutional law. He's accused him of abusing his power. And now Republican voters support of Mueller and the investigation has plummeted. And that can be traced right back to the president's Twitter feed. It doesn't hurt that Congress doesn't seem to be showing profiles in courage. Take the chairman of the Intel Committee. Now, I was going to write, please, which just, <laughs> you're above that. But Chairman Nunes, instead of acting in his role as chairman, and I had, I didn't have a ringside seat. I had a ring seat mm -hmm. with watching what Chairman Nunes did. The midnight ride. I was there, folks. You don't get to ask questions that they don't like. They don't subpoena key witnesses or key documents. I, I had Eric Prince asking questions about the meeting in the Seychelles. I'm not going to answer that. They allowed the White House to tell them what questions could and couldn't be answered, the people being investigated. Now, again, I graduated from law school in 89, but it doesn't sound like you should be able to do that. And I think we're in the business of creating questions for students, right, and examinations. Ah. The kind of direct intervention that, interve that Nunez did to first obstruct and now shut the investigation down. That led to the House findings breaking down on partisan lines and the work the Senate does, which is Senate investigation, which is far more serious. They, like the president, are protecting him legally and politically. What you're seeing perhaps now is perhaps the most dangerous, pressuring the Justice Department to release documents, right? And Rudy says, well, you're entitled to this in a court case. Yeah, it's called discovery. And you haven't been indicted yet, and you're not entitled to this stuff. And I'm concerned that Nunez and his gang are getting this information, leaking it, or turning it over to the Trump legal team. They are sabotaging the most important investigation in our lifetime. There are notable exceptions in Congress. Uh, sadly, many of them are leaving. Many of the Republicans are, are screaming at the president on his way out. Presidential pardon, wide-ranging power, some view without limits, but it was never meant to be used for corrupt purposes. It was never meant to be a get-out-of-jail-free card, but we're starting to see that. The pardon of the sheriff in Arizona was no accident. It was a tip-off to everybody else. You don't need to abide by lawfully issued subpoenas. You don't have to testify, and if they get you, don't worry, I got your back. All right, so I started that things aren't okay. They're not okay. This paints a very, very grim picture. We are suffering from news cycle fatigue. Uh, does it matter? Well, but it's true. We will outlast the Trump presidency. The timeline for that is finite. But will we outlast the long-term damage being done to our norms, our institutions, our rule of law, and our standing as world leaders. So what do we do? First, forget what everybody else has said. Let's look at ourselves. We've grown up in Chicago. Two of my last four people in my seat are in jail, went to jail, two of the last four governors. Look, we understand when people fall short of where they need to be to serve. So we understand cynicism and corruption at its core here all too well. I think it feeds into that. Why did the Russians succeed? Why was it so easy? Because we were so willing to believe the worst in each other. You read those social media ads. If you got to read them all, and I encourage you to, the only way we're going to get past this is to look at them, understand what others who have faced this Kremlin playbook have done for years in Europe. You get together on a, par a bipartisan basis, and citizens begin to understand this stuff. We may have our disagreements, but we're going to settle them ourselves. We're not going to have help 
from a foreign adversary. After Charlottesville, someone came up to me and said, that Russian investigation, you're just relitigating the election. And I said, you know, I'm not sure about that, but you all seem to be relitigating the Civil War. <laughs> so who do we turn to when we think about it in that context, right? Maybe there's no better time to remind ourselves that in less than three minutes, our greatest president talked about at Gettysburg, a new birth of freedom, right? I think he was saying 87 years ago, did we really mean it that we're all created equal? These are great lessons for today. In his healing words at the second inaugural, where he paraphrased the scriptures several times to appeal to the better angels of our nature, it was a manner in which we were accustomed to, right? Who's doing that today? But he spoke about moving forward with malice toward none. There's a lot of things we can do to resolve this and move forward, folks. But I think it begins with us and what's in here and how we move forward. Because we can't move forward with the president's tactics of hate and division. Even if we win, I don't want to be part of that. And none of us should. We must collectively protect the Department of Justice and the Mueller investigation. I saw Speaker of the House say, no one's above the law. The investigation should continue. Then put the bill on the floor. Push back on the unethical use of pardon. Defend our press. Defend the Emoluments Clause and more. I'll close by saying this, and I want you to know it's been an honor to be here with you today, and I'd be glad to take your questions. Uh, the journalist and commentator David Frum made an analogy that resonated with me. He said, when you have a sick child, it is exhausting to care for them. But you don't stop caring for them. At this moment in our history, our country is sick. And we must rely on one another to find the energy to continue caring for it. I have faith because of people like you in this room today. Let's dig deep to find the energy to nurse this great nation back to health. Thank you, and God bless. Congressman, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions. So if anybody has a question, you have these blue forms at your table. Just write down your question. Legibility is very important. If we can't read it, we'll just make up a question. Make up an answer. Absolutely. OK, first question. This is from Lou Harris, not the pollster, by the way. From City Club member Lou Harris, what are your thoughts on President Trump revising the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which you supported? Yes. Thank you. I, I think that 18 months of the Trump White House should be an education to the, those on extremes who are against any trade at all. I mean, the bottom line, we're safer and stronger when we engage negotiate and trade with other countries. All we passed was the authority for the most liberal president in the history of the United States to negotiate with the Pacific Rim partners. They were begging us to do this because they wanted an alternative to just trading with China, right? And it should include protections for labor, for the environment, and uh, all human rights issues. But I had faith that President Obama could do that, and we have it in his heart to do that. Do you think the Chinese care about those? They're entering trade deals left and right, and none of those protections are in there. So there's lessons from the beginning of the 20th century that countries that engage, that talk, are safer and stronger. The last time I was briefed on the trade deal from the White House, was in the Situation Room with Sandy Berger, talking exactly in those details 
about why that trade deal would keep America safe. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> this is the CPA's question, Congressman. It's from Linda Foreman, City Club member. Her question is, if you want to raise revenue, when will you increase funding for the IRS? It's short-staffed, can't audit effectively. Some of us are very glad for that. <laughs> or quickly resolve issues. They get $15 for every dollar you fund. Well, you know where Linda's coming from. Sure. Uh, I'm on the probes committee. That's my subcommittee. That's part of my initial line. I'm doing what I have to do, not what I really want to do, which is focus on appropriations. Uh, if you're a far left, far right person, you want the IRS to function appropriately. The tax reform, I'm going to go off to a, a little bit of a tangent, but the tax reform tax change plan that, that was just passed does just the opposite. We're going to lose revenues because we don't fund the IRS, and we're going to lose a lot of revenues. We're going to increase the debt and deficit by $1.5 trillion over the next year. And it will barely, even if you believe Goldman Sachs and the Tax Institute, it will grow the economy minimally. So we're facing real dangers about being able to function as a government and address our long-term debts because we don't fund the government, we don't fund the IRS to the levels appropriate. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is from City Club member Ted Manuel. When will the Democratic National Committee announce its new platform going forward? I, I think the reference is to the reforms that have been talked about. I don't know what their timetable is. I have been part of uh, discussions where I've heard proposals coming forth. I suggest sometime, I'm guessing sometime in the summer. They're talking about how delegates and superdelegates create. I think one thing you'll see for sure, you'll see sup fewer superdelegates, more elected delegates, you'll see fewer caucuses and more primaries, and that's not a bad thing. Okay. Oh, you found the water, good. Because you have a great staff. They were really worried if you had enough water, and we really appreciate that. Yeah, they want to get the coffee cup, by the way. Okay. Uh, this is from Maggie Sheehy, who's with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Maggie, I see you said you're not a member of the City Club. We invite you to join. We're just short 2,500 members. 50 bucks, that's our only requirement. No security test or anything. And it's tax deductible, by the way, I think. Anyhow. Used to be. It used to be, we're not sure. All depends what Linda says. She's the CPA. Uh, what can Congress do about the tariffs the President is imposing on goods from China, Canada, Mexico, the EU, and other countries? I think this is part of the bipartisan, it's time to stand up time, right? I, I, hear, I hear my colleagues on the Republican side disagree with the President. They do it most vociferously if they're on their way out the door. Uh, this is something they claim to care about very, very much. I, uh, the opportunities are there. I think that's true with this issue. I think from a timely point of view, it's true this week. We are seeing immigration bills on the floor for the first time since ever that I have been there. Um, the right bill isn't going to pass without courageous Republicans supporting it and Democrats willing to compromise. On this issue, the answer is the same. Okay, this is from uh, Chicago Home Builder and City Club member Bird Hoffman. Bird, where are you, Bird? Right back there, great, okay. With what little money that's left in Trump's budget for discretionary spending, what would you consider to be Chicagoland's top infrastructure priorities? Um, I'm the second ranking Democrat on that subcommittee and someday want to be the chairman, maybe next January. And this meeting will be a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say this. Uh, I think we've got to treat earmarks and appropriations differently than we have in the past. So I, I think we all know what we need to do. We need to help 
Metro with the infrastructure issues right outside their doors. We need to help Pace get more rolling equipment. We need to rebuild the blue line. And I'm not, I have nothing against Musk and the high speed thing, but I'm trying to get something redone so that, you know, the people alive today can use it. So <laughs> we, we, we rebuilt the red line. I'm trying to get the blue line rebuilt because it, it, I have nothing against that. I just, I want to be the most practical guy in the room. So the answer to the question is, I want to rebuild what we have right now, because we're way behind. We have a lot of freight issues as you head south, heading into Indiana, like at key junctures. We've got to get those done. There's so much rolling stock that's necessary, the bridges uh, right, right outside, Union Station as well. But back to how we should do it better, is it really should be a collective discussion. I, if we're going to do an infrastructure bill or appropriation bills every year, if I'm chairman of that committee, I'm meeting with the mayor, I'm meeting with the president of the Cook County Board, my, the aldermen, the commissioners, the state reps, the state senators, say, what are our priorities? And then all the members from Chicago, all members of Ch Congress should have the same priorities. We had earmarks my first term, and it was uh, herding cats. Like, we want this, we want that. I should be just as concerned about what Bobby Rush wants as he is about what I need. I should be just as concerned about the, fa the farmers needing repairing the locks on the Mississippi as they are about the purple line. So this is a we're all in this together moment. So if I'm going to change anything, it's how we do it. And the fact that Chicago moves forward on a regional basis concerned about its collective needs. Okay, we have time for two last questions, Congressman. Which is ironic because there's only two left. <laughs> I can come up with many more. Actually, I'm combining these, so we're going right. to. Uh, both uh, Deborah Ingram, who's uh, an Attorney City Club member, and Lauren Tucker from Indivisible Chicago City Club member, ask the same question. Other than voting, what can we as individuals do to help our country in the face of what is happening now? Um, round up two or three friends, uh, engage them. I don't, I think most policy problems have political solutions. So I tell folks, I want to get out there. I often hear that just before an election. I say, you know, I don't think we need any more troops. I think we need more people who would engage others to work in an election process, not just here in Illinois, because there are critical races, but others as well. I need people to be the most practical citizen they possibly can. You don't have unlimited time or resources. I'll just point it to the house. I don't want to be a government in exile. I don't want to be the great messenger. I don't want to be the guy pounding the table. I want to be a chairman. I want to be part of 218 or more. You need to put almost everything else out of your mind than being tactically and strategically smart to get to that point. You don't like the president's appointments to the courts, right? Work on all the Senate races. You got one in Wisconsin, you got one in Indiana. Be smart about it, be, pra be practical, uh, and gain as, engage as many of your friends as possible. Don't let anyone get tired of the news cycle and uh, stay close to your friends. Thanks. Well, well, first we have a little different question, Congressman. We know uh, that you and your staff take great care of your mm -hmm. constituents, but this is a little different kind of question. We know that you're an ice hockey fan. The National Hockey League draft is coming up. The Blackhawks failed to qualify for the playoffs this year. So what should they do to make sure they get back in the playoffs next year? Uh, get rid of the salary cap. <laughs> Wish live long and prosper to Corey Crawford. Change the ping pong balls so we could have had the first pick. I can't complain. I, uh, folks, it, the Hawks went from 1961 to 2010 without winning the Stanley Cup. And I was there in Philadelphia with Oh, such pleasant, pleasant. I, was, I must have been surrounded by the Chamber of Commerce of Philadelphia. 
it was an extraordinary experience where I, you know, Pepsi baths and so forth. So I, I just, I have to pivot this a little bit and just remind myself that I, I made a promise in overtime just before Pat's cane scored that I would never complain about the Hawks again if they just won the Stanley Cup once. And after they won and the review came in and I saw the guy run to the bench and say it's a good goal, I stood up and I saluted the Philly fans in a manner in which my predecessor in Congress would have been proud. <laughs> So now it's really rough. And the security guy goes, I can't protect you. We're getting you out of here. So Ravi Beshwal from Channel 7 stops me and he says, Congressman, uh, can we talk to you just for a minute? We're on live TV in Chicago. And uh, you have to forgive me. I remember, I grew up in the old second balcony of Chicago Stadium. I still play hockey. So, you know, perhaps I could have been more diplomatic in my words. Because uh, he said, you know, what do you think? I think John McDonough and Rocky and Jay and the Q and the, the whole team. And he said, we've extinguished the ghost of Jacques Lemaire. Because, yeah, I was listening to WGN when the Hawks lost to the Canadians in 1971 in Chicago. And uh, that's all. That's what you say on one of these things. But you know what? Again, the old sec you can take the guy out of the old second balcony, but you can't take the second balcony out of the guy. He says, and what do you think of these Flyer fans? Now remember, folks, I'm not near the Flyer fans. I'm like this with the Flyer fans. You would have been proud of me. I said, uh, well, they need a shave and a shower. And as for the men, <laughs> man, oh man. They didn't take it well at all. So, so I'm, a, I'm, I'm getting taken away and I see John and Jay and they let me on the ice and all of a sudden I like the Flyer fans. And they escorted me in the locker room. So there's a picture of me holding up the Stanley Cup in the winning locker room. So how can I, I'm done. I was there and I was in Cleveland when the Cubs won. So I had a deal with the Almighty, the deal's done, we're all good. Uh, and I'm a happy guy. <laughs> <laughs>